which is essentially a sort of genetic continuation of the sport of military plunder. The first significant Jewish capital was amassed as a result of speculation in Byzantine relics. An unprecedented flow of free money caused the Western European cities to grow turbulently and became the decisive catalyst in the development of craft, science, and the arts. The barbaric West became the civilized West only after it had taken over, seized, destroyed, and swallowed up the Byzantine Empire. We must admit that our own Slavic forebears were no more well-mannered and also succumbed to the barbaric temptation to get rich quick at the expense of Constantinople's seemingly inexhaustible wealth. However, to their credit, and fortunately for us, their lust for the spoils of war did not eclipse the most important thing. Russians comprehended Byzantium's greatest treasure. This was neither gold, nor expensive textiles, nor even art and sciences. The greatest treasure of Byzantium was God. Having traveled the world over in the search of the truth and God, the ambassadors of Grand Prince Vladimir of Russia experienced only in Byzantium that a true relationship between God and man exists, that it's possible for us to have living contact with another world. We did not know whether we were in heaven or on earth said the ancestors of present-day Russians, astounded by their experience of divine liturgy in the empire's most important cathedral, the Hagia Sophia. They understood just what kind of treasure can be obtained in Byzantium. It was upon this treasure that our great forebears founded not banks, nor capital, nor even museums and pawn shops. They founded Rus, Russia, the spiritual successor of Byzantium. So what made it possible for a nation so great in the arena of world history with such extraordinary capabilities to so suddenly begin to lose its life-giving force? What is most interesting is that the problems Byzantium met during its period of decline, aggression from foreign nations, natural disasters, economic and political crises, were nothing new for this over a thousand year old government with its proven mechanism for getting out of the most difficult situations. After all, the empire had experienced all these things before and had overcome them. Yes, there were many envious enemies, both east and west. There were earthquakes. There were plagues. But it was not these which crushed Byzantium. All of these problems could have been overcome if only the Byzantines had been able to overcome themselves. Today, we'll talk about that inner enemy which appeared within the spiritual depths of Byzantine society and broke the spirit of that great nation, turning it into a helpless victim of those historical challenges which Byzantium was no longer able to answer. Nowadays, we generally assess a society's well-being according to its economy. Although the word economics and even the science of economics itself hails from Byzantium, the Byzantines themselves never gave it much attention. The Byzantine financial economic system underwent several serious crises during the course of history, but the effectiveness of the empire's industry and agriculture 
generally enabled it to weather the storms. Suffice it to say that for a thousand years, all international trade was based upon the Byzantine gold coin. But Byzantium could not solve the problem of its government's loss of control over its own finances and the huge ungovernable process of capital flow towards the West to developing Europe. And this is what finally destroyed its economy. The government dropped all levers of trade and industry and in the end gave all its trade and industrial resources over to foreign entrepreneurs. It happened like this. An important financial resource in the country was not gas and oil, as it is now, but customs obtained from the enormous international trade in the Bosphorus and Dardanelles. The Byzantines, who earlier relied solely upon their own capability to govern the country's economics, suddenly began heated discussions about, and finally decided upon, consigning the problems of international trade to their foreign friends, who were more resourceful and ready to take responsibility for the expense of complex transport, armed guards along trade routes, the construction of new ports, and the intensification and development of commercial activities. Western specialists were called in from Venice and Genoa, towns which had grown large on several centuries of Byzantine trade. They were granted duty-free trade and entrusted with the patrol of sea routes along the empire's territory. The West began, by hook or by crook, to lure Byzantium into the formative prototype of unified European trade organizations, and taking advantage of one of the most complicated periods in the life of the empire, succeeded in reaching its aim. Emperor Alexeus of Komnenos signed an international trade agreement to the empire's great disadvantage, called the Golden Bula. This agreement was in actuality deceitful,